nutrition for mood and mind health. Um, so as a nutritional therapist myself, I'll be giving as much practical information as possible. Um, so looking at diet, diagnostic testing, and also the relevant supplements that we have here at Igenis and how these can help your clients in terms of improving mood and mind health. Um, so just to go through a brief introduction on what mood and mind disorders actually mean and what this includes. Um, these can range anything from diagnosed health conditions such as depression, anxiety, bipolar, ADHD, autism, dementia, to other symptoms such as poor memory, difficulty concentrating, confusion and sleep disturbances. So quite a range of different conditions um, that mood and mind really um, includes. Um, so these are the conditions I'll be talking about tonight. And just to give you an idea of the scale of these problems and how common they are, um, one in four British adults experience at least one of these diagnosable mental health conditions in a year and one in six experiences this at any given time. So very, very common. And depression is projected to become the leading cause of global burden of disease by 2013. So really a big problem um, and that really can be helped. So depression is um, as a term to describe a wide range of disorders. So a lot of the studies that I'll be talking through often mention depression, and these can include things such as disturbed sleep, difficulty concentrating, anxiety, and other similar mood and mind disorders. Um, so we're looking at the actual causes of mood and mind disorders. Um, they're not always understood. So what is actually happening in the brain and the body um, can be due to a range of reasons. So there is a certain component of interaction between genetics and environment. And of course, diet plays a huge role as well. So this can be anything from deficiencies, um, also toxicity. So example for um, pregnant women having high levels of methyl mercury can affect and developing brain and balances, lifestyle and inflammation in the body as well can have such an impact on the brain and how your body deals with stress. So um, raised cortisol levels, for example, and then levels of neurotransmitters. Um, so low levels of neurotransmitters, so these are the chemical messengers in the brain, they're associated with depression and other mood and mind disorders. So having low levels of serotonin, for example, can really affect someone's mood. And then looking at the psychological or physiological component, of course, there's going to be both there. So if someone has low mood, if it's a reactive form of depression, for example, due to a certain circumstance, then the talking therapy may be able to help someone like this. But if there's a physiological problem, an imbalance, um, toxicity, for example, um, then there really is a problem and people need um, further, further help. So... In terms of nutrition help, um, not many people associate diet with mood health. So a lot of other conditions out there, people do understand that there's a link between deficiencies, for example, and physical illness. However, with depression and other mood-related disorders such as anxiety, people still aren't very aware of these correlations um, with Western diets. So so deficient in many nutrients and vitamins, especially um, omega-3s, for example, um, it's not surprising that there's so many mood disorders out there now. Um, so the actual levels of deficiencies in people with mood and mind disorders is very high, and there definitely is a link, but it's just that people aren't particularly aware of this link. Um, and the strongest link in terms of all the different um, dietary aspects is with fish consumption. So going on to a nice graph here showing the correlation between fish consumption in a few different countries around the world and the level of depression, um, there's a very clear association with high um, intake of fish in Japan, for example, um, correlating with very low levels of depression. And then on the other scale, in countries such as New Zealand and Germany and Canada, very high levels of depression and very low consumption of fish. Of course, this is just an association study, but it does suggest that there could be something there in fish. So it's important to look into this. And other studies, similar studies looking at other mood and mind related disorders, such as bipolar disorder, also schizophrenia, have, have shown similar associations. So again, um, lower levels of these conditions with higher intake of fish. So what is it in the fish that could be causing these effects? 
Um, there are quite a lot of very important nutrients in fish. So it's important to consider all of these, not just um, looking at just the fats or just the protein, for example. Um, so the association and what there is in the fish and seafood and how this correlates to mood and mind disorders could be due to the rich source of micronutrients, for example, which act as cofactors for neurological processes. So very important for neurotransmitter production and in the methylation pathway. So this is the breakdown of amino acids, which is needed for the production of neurotransmitters. Um, so these are the folic acid, B vitamins, so B12, B6, which are very, very high in fish and are very, very important um, for these processes. So it could also be the high levels of protein, so the tryptophan and phenylalanine. So these are also very important for regulating appetite, sleep, memory, learning, mood and behavior. So lots of very important things that are that are needed from protein from the fish and also the obvious um, nutritional component that's very, very high in fish is the amount of omega-3 essential fats. So very high levels of EPA and DHA in fish. But of course, we need to be able to differentiate between different types of fish because if we're looking at the omega-3 EPA and DHA content of fish, it's going to be very different if you're having oily fish or white fish. So studies looking at fish overall um, don't necessarily show um, whether it's from oily fish or whether it's the other components of the fish and the other nutrients. So studies looking at the actual omega-3 content of the red blood cells and then correlating this to depression gives us a better idea of whether it is the omega-3 that's really playing a big role here. Um, so the omega-3 concentration is often very low in depressed individuals in the red blood cell um, membrane, so this, the measured levels. Um, and this is associated also with the severity of depression. So very, very low levels of the red blood cell omega-3 is associated with um, very severe forms of depression. So it does really suggest that there is uh, a correlation there that's quite important. And also looking at the actual ratio between the specific fats, so looking at arachidonic acids, the omega-3 fat, the ratio between this to EPA seems to be a better um, marker of the severity of depression and this is a really important biomarker of inflammation generally so inflammatory products and also this ratio specifically has shown to really correlate with severity of depression so EPA especially and the ratio to arachidonic acid is what we should be considering so inflammation in the body so I was saying that arachidonic acid to EPA is a biomarker of inflammation a small amount of inflammation, of course, is good. You need some inflammation in the body. It's a normal biological response to harmful stimuli for your body to be able to heal wounds. And usually in the body, if inflammation is working well, then this should be effective in healing the body um, in acute inflammation. So if you have an acute problem. Um, however, a lot of people have chronic inflammation. So if there's chronic inflammation in the body if, for example, we have high levels of the arachidonic acid and low levels of EPA, so consistent inflammation, low-grade inflammation, this is when this can result in cumulative damage in the body and this can then lead to illness. So next on to a nice diagram which just shows the different metabolic pathways. So on the right-hand side here, we've got the omega-3 fatty acids and on the left, the omega-6 as well. Um, so this is just to understand really the different types of fats in the body and how this relates to the two that we were talking about. <clears throat> so the arachidonic acid being the omega-6 fat here and then the omega-3 EPA. So, so the omega-3 ALA, the alpha-linolenic acid, this is found in foods such as linseeds um, and then the EPA from the fish and then the arachidonic acid here from meats and then the other omega-6 lots of them found from vegetable oils just so you know where they're all coming from so again this ratio very important um, a good ratio to have is around 1.5 to 3 so having lower amounts um, of the arachidonic acid um, producing better health outcomes so having lower amounts of inflammation in the body and this is just a very very good indication for measuring inflammation in the body and for measuring inflammatory related conditions so a ratio being any higher than a seven 
is really linked to lots of inflammatory conditions in the body. So this could be um, depression, cardiovascular disease, joint problems, um, and many, many more. So here's a list of some of the essential fatty acids and where they come from from foods. So a lot of these foods do actually overlap. So um, a lot of the nuts, for example, walnuts and hemp seed, they have omega-6 and omega-3, but they're, these um, foods here are higher in omega-6, and these are the short-chain fatty acids. So in the last diagram, the alpha-linolenic acid and the steridonic acid for the omega-3s, and the linoleic acid and GLA for omega-6. And then the long-chain products, the animal products, these um, the arachidonic acid and the EPA from fish. So ideally we want to have a good ratio in the body between the omega-6 and omega-3. So a few decades ago, before agriculture, um, most people seem to have quite good ratios between omega-3 and omega-6 in the body. Everyone was happy and there were less inflammatory conditions. However, unfortunately, with modern times, omega-6 is much, much higher in the, in the body. And this partly can be due to modern farming. Um, a lot of animals now are grain-fed rather than grass-fed, so this is naturally higher in omega-6. Um, the grasses before were higher in omega-3, so meats are much, much higher um, in omega-6. And also, the use of vegetable oils in so many processed foods is a lot higher. So anything from cakes, breads, crisps, so many things have hidden omega-6 vegetable oils in often heat processed as well um, so the fats ruined in that process as well um, and also with fish as well farmed fish has a high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 so even if people are getting in the, the similar foods that, that people wear pre-agriculture um, it's very very hard to get a balance between these two and especially with um, dietary habits of lots of refined and processed foods as well so here's a graph just to show the different um, amounts of fats in each of these different oils. So if we look at sunflower oil and corn oil, for example, they're very, very high in the omega-6 fats. So these are the linoleic acid. Um, in small amounts in the body, and if these are balanced with omega-3, this is absolutely fine. But so many products, especially these two fats, corn oil and sunflower oil, are used in a lot of processed foods now. Um, so people don't necessarily realise they're having them, um, but they're much, much higher in our diets now. And then other seeds, such as flax seeds, that aren't necessarily consumed enough. Of course, some very healthy people will be consuming their flax seeds, but not enough people. Um, and then there's echium seed oil as well, which also has very good ratios of the different fats, higher in omega-3 as well. Um, and then a similar graph as well, just showing the overall omega-3 to omega-6 composition. So if you look at all these oils on the left, very, very high in omega-6. Um, so even walnut oil and hemp seed oil. If walnut oil, if you're having just this and you weren't having other oils as well high in omega-6, you might be okay. But because some people have high levels of omega-6, it's quite important to add more of these fats in that are higher in the omega-3 contents of the flaxseed oil, echium seed oil. Right, so in terms of figuring out whether a client or yourself has um, an omega-3 deficiency, there are quite a lot of um, symptoms, signs that can point towards knowing whether you may be deficient or not. So often with skin-related signs, so having dry skin, um, dry hair, and often brittle nails can be a sign of low omega-3s. Um, also dry, dry patchy skin, eczema, psoriasis, dandruff, dry eyes, so basically everything dry um, can point to having an omega-3 deficiency. And also relating to mood health, having low attention and having concentration problems as well, and just generally low mood is associated with um, a low omega-3. So a possible deficiency if, if someone comes to you and has a lot of these symptoms, um, and also having low energy as well, and or sleep and lots of inflammation in the body so if they have an inflammatory condition as well perhaps um, and have low mood then this may suggest um, an omega-3 deficiency and this can be the short chain 
and the long chain as well. So here are just some of the conditions which are linked to omega-3 deficiency, so quite a lot. Um, so this can range from neurological disorders, um, inflammatory bowel disease, mental health disorders, and cardiovascular disease. And in particular, there's a comorbidity between cardiovascular disease and mental health conditions. A lot of people with depression or other mood-related disorders do have high risk of cardiovascular disease. And other way around, people with cardiovascular disease are very um, likely to have some form of mental health issue or low mood or depression, for example. So they do overlap quite a lot as they have um, possibly similar causes of having um, an omega-3 deficiency. So in terms of conversion between different fats, of course it is the EPA from fish which is the long chain fatty acid. So this is the fat needed in your body to um, produce these anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. But if someone's vegetarian for example or they don't eat fish, um, aren't having any supplements and they're wanting to know how much uh, other foods high in omega-3, high in the alpha and lenic acid for example, they need to have. Um, it does vary between people. A lot of people will have to have very, very high levels if they're not having fish in their diet. Only about 5 to 8 percent of alpha and lenic acid is actually converted down to the anti-inflammatory cosinoids. Um, so of course some will be converted, but it's just very important to, to know and to be aware that there's very poor conversion in the body and a lot of the fats are just used up as energy and then um, the beneficial effects won't be used and won't um, won't be happening if you don't actually get the EPA in there. So important to have the readily used form of omega-3 in the EPA. Um, so in terms of the actual message of having more fish, a lot of people know they need to eat more fish. Um, people just don't really understand how much, what type of fish, um, but the actual current recommendations are set at 450 milligrams a day. So these are oily fish, um, oily, a portion of oily fish once a week and white fish once a week as well. Um, so this does give fairly good levels of EPA and DHA in the body. Um, unfortunately, the actual intake is around 244 milligrams a day. So much, much lower and um, just over half of what the actual recommendations are. Um, and the only worry with fish is the um, the actual levels of environmental toxins. So with people having um, large fish, tuna, for example, and salmon, the recommendations can't be much higher than two portions of fish a week as it's quite easy to have too many of these um, environmental toxins in the fish. Um, but still, even with this message, it's still hard to get people to eat the right amount. So definitely messages to get more fish in the diet. So looking at the evidence between fish intake and depression is not always clear. So the association um, does sometimes vary between the studies. So of course there may be a certain area of having different dietary assessment methods um, and different depressive symptoms, different definitions, so different measurements. Um, and other confounding factors, however, it's most likely to be due to um, so the list here, so the different types of fish that are consumed. So a lot of these studies don't really specify the type of fish. So they'll say someone had two portions of fish a week, but they're not really specifying or whether the fish is oily or white, for example, and whether the fish is farmed or wild. So the, the ratios of omega-3 to omega-6 are very, very different for fish that are farmed versus wild. Um, so then the omega-3 content to omega-6 content is unknown in these studies, often with the, the fish that people are consuming and also the ratio between EPA to DHA. Um, so herring and salmon and anchovies, for example, are very naturally high in EPA, whereas other fish have more DHA. So the ratio does vary a little bit there. Um, and then the cooking method as well. So whether the fish is steamed, baked, fried, uh, frying fish at very high temperatures can sometimes spoil the, the fats there as well. So more gentle cooking methods such as baking um, are much better for keeping the fats in the fish. And also the, um, the processing methods, for example, having 
tinned tuna has much, much lower levels of the oil in there. So although people often get their dietary intake from tinned tuna, it's not the best source in terms of having the essential fat. So here's just a list of the fish consumption patterns in the UK. So cod still being very highly consumed, so 29.9%, so about nearly a third of the fish consumed from cod, and then also tuna and salmon quite high as well. Um, and then smaller fish, haddock, place, herring, mackerel, um, much less consumed. So here's a list of the omega-3 content of different types of fish. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, the different types of fish and what you could possibly recommend to clients as well in terms of getting the fish in there and getting high amounts of omega-3 but not worrying too much about having the large layer fish. So example, um, mackerel and herring are smaller fish but very, very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So they're a really, really good one to recommend. So then when considering the difference between dietary fish or fish oil supplements, um, there is a link with omega-3 and fish consumption with depression, um, but then looking at the actual link between supplements and mood disorders, um, the results again are conflicting as with fish consumption. Um, in the past, fish oils were grouped together, EPA and DHA was just together in one supplement, um, but now studies have been able to to really find the difference between EPA and DHA. And now it's quite clear with meta-analyses um, showing the differences of studies and results, comparing studies using EPA on mood disorders and also DHA. So here's a very good meta-analysis which clearly shows why the results before may have been a bit misleading. So on the, the bottom half here, these are studies that used supplements with EPA and DHA. And then supplements here on the right hand side are EPA only on their own. So of course there's um, a much better correlation, it's much easier to see the EPA is making a difference and um, is favoured over a placebo, whereas um, normal products, normal supplements with EPA and DHA have not. So now we know that EPA is an important part in reducing um, antidepressant effects in the body. So in terms of these findings, um, the most important thing really is to determine the dose of the supplement and also the type of supplement. So the type being the EPA and the dose in these studies were shown that at least one gram a day was needed for at least three months to show significant effects, so significant antidepressant benefits. Um, so very, very important if you're seeing clients to keep this in mind and to and to know that there's quite a difference between different fish oils um, that you know you need to have a very high levels of EPA rather than just having a generic fish oil with EPA and DHA at lower levels. Um, right, so study looking, another study looking at the effects of EPA and DHA. So this is a 12 week trial and um, looking at a group with um, depression and looking comparing EPA and DHA and it also showed that the effects were very good with more severe forms of depression so the supplements really helped particularly with people with more severe forms um, so here's the graph showing the results so statistically significant effect with the EPA however no effect of the same as the placebo for the DHA group so again just to confirm that it really is the EPA so products in studies that have used pure DPA have shown absolutely no antidepressant effects and studies with mixed EPA and DHA have shown some antidepressant effects and then the best effects, statistically significant effects have been with pure EPA. So here's just to summarise um, how, how supplements EPA, ethyl in particular, can help with depression. So ethyl EPA is the form of EPA supplements that have been used in these studies. Um, so they have shown to regulate neurotransmitter function, they help to reduce cortisol levels in the body. They're also very good for restoring this arachidonic acid to EPA ratio and also helping to regulate 
the inflammation. So, of course, because of the ratio, the aphidonic acid to EPA ratio, very, very important for reducing these pro-inflammatory cytokines and increasing the anti-inflammatory products. Um, also, neuroprotective, so protecting against diseases such as Alzheimer's, um, and then also maintaining cell membrane integrity. So this will help with the movement of substances in and out of the cells. Very important for cell signaling, which again is very important for any kind of mood and mind related disorders. Um, so when choosing a facial product, the quality does range quite a lot, quite dramatically. So from the lower end of the scale, um, looking at cod liver oil supplements, which a few decades ago were very, very popular, um, but now very high in toxins naturally because there's so many toxins in the sea, unfortunately. Um, and these products are often not molecularly distilled or concentrated um, and not particularly high levels of EPA, so fish body oil as well. Um, naturally, there's only about 30% of this oil, which is EPA and DHA, so 18% content being EPA. So if you're having a 1,000 milligram supplement, um, which is quite large, then only 18% of that is actually EPA. And then if you go through to pharmaceutical grade oils, designer, omega-3 isolates, and then therapeutic pure EPA oils, these are more concentrated, and then you can um, concentrate just the EPA part. So really having uh, a supplement specifically for reducing inflammation in the body. And having therapeutic doses as well, having 1,000 milligrams of EPA rather than just having 18% to 180 milligrams of a big capsule. So also very good for um, clients that don't want to take lots of big capsules and much have it in the concentrated form. So here's just a nice little diagram to show the different concentrations in supplements. So 18% EPA on the left and going up through to 90% EPA. Um, so in terms of getting therapeutic dose, much, much easier with concentrated products. Um, so at Igenis, we have the Restore and Maintain Pharmipa products. These are very, very high dose EPA. So step one is 1,000 milligrams EPA. We have a step one, step two approach as it's usually quite good for people to start with a step one to really bump up the levels of EPA um, in the cell membrane. And then after about three to six months, they can move on to the step two, which is slightly lower levels of EPA. And also there's a little bit of GLA in, so the omega-6. Um, I wouldn't recommend having an omega-6 supplement someone that has inflammation already um, because their enzymes um, in the metabolism pathways, the fats are more likely to convert these fats into the inflammatory eicosanoids. But if someone's been on the farm for step one, for example, they've increased their omega-3s, their EPA is a lot, then hopefully they'll have a balance between omega-3s and omega-6 and they can start introducing other fats as well. Um, so there's also in the step two, vitamin B5 and D3, so very good for supporting the metabolic pathways um, for the fat, so really good for, for long term. Um, so if someone does ha already have severe depression or they're worried about their mood health, um, if it's more severe, I definitely recommend starting with step one, um, having one to two a day, and having with food as well, always easy to absorb with food, and then step two, long term. If someone doesn't really have a problem, they just want to prevent something in the future, they could start straight away onto step two as well. And these supplements, they're derived from anchovies, so small, short-lived fish, naturally low in contaminants as well, um, and, and purified as well. So if you do have a vegetarian client, um, there is an option available. Um, people often go down the linseed or algae hemp seed route. Hemp seed is quite high in omega-6 anyway, so I wouldn't recommend that at all for inflammation um, or for depression or any kind of mood-related disorders. Linseeds, as we discussed earlier, only about 5 to 8% is actually converted down, so you need huge, huge amounts of linseed to, to actually result in the anti-inflammatory effects. And then algae oils are naturally very, very high in DHA, so DHA being a structural fat, um, not particularly useful for reducing inflammation and for mood and mind health. So you really want to find something um, that's going to increase the EPA levels in the body. So Echi Omega is derived from Echium seed oil. Um, this is a very high source of the omega-3 fat, steroidonic acid. 
So this is the precursor to EPA. So this is converted in the body. About 25 to 30 percent of this is converted to EPA. So not as ideal as having an EPA supplement, but if someone's vegetarian, then this is the next best thing. And um, they can have higher doses if they really want, if they have um, a severe depression, for example, or bipolar disorder. But ideally, I would recommend having farm EPA. Um, having the EPA is better. But at least there's something here. So in terms of tests, um, always very good to be able to test your clients and to be able to really understand what's going on in the body. So a simple blood test to measure the levels of fatty acids in the cell membranes um, can really help to give you an idea of how to recommend certain supplements and maybe to monitor um, how this is helping, how the supplement protocol and their diets changing things. Um, so in particular, very important to measure the ratio between arachidonic acid and EPA. Um, and also having one of these tests, all the other fats you can measure as well, omega-7, omega-9, it's quite nice to really understand if someone's really missing something in their diet. Um, it can be quite difficult to, to guess these things. A lot of um, symptoms are, are quite similar with, with different levels of fats in the body. Um, but especially um, for children with autism, for example, they can have very low enzyme um, levels, they can have difficulties metabolizing fats down, so they can have very unusual fatty acid profiles. And some people just find that they do these tests and realize that their, their EPA can be very, very low, even if they're consuming um, fish, for example. They may be using up in the body if there's so much inflammation, so they may need quite a high dose. And so that's very, very useful to be able to do a test like that. And then also um, doing a saliva test for testing your adrenals. So I spoke a little bit earlier about the stress pr profile. So in terms of how much cortisol and DHA your bodies are producing, as cortisol can really affect the blood sugar balance, immune health, um, and also can lead to anxiety and poor sleep, depression, and low reduced memory and um, bad concentration, for example. So there's a lot of things that stress in the body can directly link to depression and can also directly affect inflammation in the body. So if someone's very, very stressed, this can increase the inflammation and that in turn may increase their need for EPA in the body. Um, but of course, testing all these things really, really does help to, to clarify what's going on. And then lastly, um, homocysteine. So this is quite a useful test to do as well. So this is, homocysteine is a harmful byproduct of the methylation cycle. So this is the, the process that's important for the production of neurotransmitters, so those chemical messengers in the brain. Um, so homocysteine is usually converted to the essential proteins involved in the processes such as uh, sleep and mood regulation. But if someone has an accumulation of this homocysteine, if their methylation pathways aren't working very well, then this is an increased risk factor for cardiovascular disease and also dementia and depression as well. So like I was saying earlier, cardiovascular disease and depression are very interlinked um, and it's often due to high levels of homocysteine in the body. So for your body to be able to process homocysteine well, it's very important to have the B vitamins. So again, these B vitamins are high in fish, so fish seem to um, be helping with reducing inflammation with EPA and also the B vitamins. Um, for reducing homocysteine in the body. And methylation, this methylation process is very important for normal cell division and DNA repair. So we really want to make sure that homocysteine levels are controlled to a healthy amount so that there's no more damage that's being caused. So just a little bit here about the important vitamins and minerals that are needed in the body. So of course, we've gone through all the different supplements, but in terms of diet, these are some of the important vitamins and minerals that have been linked to um, for deficiencies in the vitamins and minerals have been linked to more depressive effects or more mood and mind disorders. So vitamin D, of course, a very well known one now, of course, so many people are deficient in vitamin D in this country, so we don't get enough sun. And of course, if someone has darker skin as well, living in this country, they really are very, very likely to be deficient in vitamin D as they need more sun exposure to be able to make the vitamin D in their bodies. So um, vitamin D, of course, sunlight is the main source. However, there are also small amounts in fish, oysters, eggs, and also fortified products now. 
um, but are very important to get out in the sun when you can in the summer. I think it's the end of the summer now though, so not sure we'll get much more vitamin D. Um, so next, magnesium. So magnesium is found in soil, but however, with a lot of modern farming techniques, these levels are now quite low. So lots of vi um, vegetables and whole grains that do contain magnesium are often not as high as they used to be. So we do need a lot more of these foods now. And um, so the dark green leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds, beans and lentils. Um, and this is very important for supporting sleep and also bipolar disorder, very important to get enough magnesium in there. Um, next, B vitamins, which I've spoken a little bit about before, especially for reducing um, homocysteine in the body. So again, nuts and seeds, fish, a lot of the same kind of foods. Um, selenium, again, very important. Um, and often low levels of selenium have been associated with, with depression or other kind of mood-related disorders. Um, and then zinc as well, very, very important. And other antioxidants as well. Um, but zinc, yeah, with... Uh, with depression, very, very important. So next is the important vitamin, vitamins and minerals and some of the products we have at Igenus. So I've spoken a bit about homocysteine control. Here is a supplement that provides high levels of the B vitamins. If someone's not getting enough from their diet, if they don't have fish in their diet, for example, um, they're very likely to have low B12, and if someone has problems with digestion, they may not be absorbing um, B12 very well as well. And this is very important, especially for, for preventing dementia. Um, B12 is very, very important for this. And generally, just reducing homocysteine is just so, so important for both cardiovascular disease and um, for mood health. So high levels of homocysteine really disrupt the neurotransmitter function in the, in the brain. So this can affect mood quite a lot. And so all these B vitamins really help to reduce the, the right neurotransmitters in the brain and help to protect against depression and neurodegeneration and cardiovascular disease. Um, so really, really important to recommend to someone if they are having low levels of their diet or if they just need some support um, for a, for a few months, they could they could try and see if it makes a difference. And if they've done a test as well, it's quite useful to to have something at a decent dose because it's quite difficult to get these from the diet. And of course, if someone has high le levels of stress, these do deplete the B vitamins. Um, so another good way to, to add this in if someone has had a lot of stress, as you don't want any more damage occurring with the homocysteine, which does cause direct damage on the brain. Um, this can degenerate Alzheimer's as well. So the next product we have is NeuroBalance. Um, so these are, this is a very good product, especially for children with ADHD. So a lot of the vitamins and minerals here, the ones listed in important vitamins and minerals a couple of slides ago, as these are very important um, for making neurotransmitters in the brain. So especially good for memory and um, helping to reduce insomnia, nervousness, hyperactivity, um, really good for improving conditions with um, symptoms for autistic children uh, magnesium especially very good for mood balancing as well and um, great for bipolar disorder um, but yeah this product especially for children is very 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 good so next protein and meat um, protein mustn't be forgotten we've spoken a lot about fats a lot about different minerals and vitamins and minerals but protein um, is so important for neurotransmitter production and so really to helping helping out these brain messengers so foods such as meat fish nut seeds eggs cheese beans and lentils um, really great for helping to to boost these the, the production of these neurotransmitters um, so in particular the the tryptophan um, the amino acid tryptophan is very good for helping to synthesize serotonin and so a lot of these foods again so the eggs cheese seeds and poultry and so this tryptophan then converts to 5-HTP in the body and then to serotonin uh, other um, things such as melatonin for sleep regulation there are a few foods which have suggested to balance out melatonin but one of the most important things and um, for balancing melatonin is to 
get out and see daylight early on in the day and then this does help to balance melatonin and will help people to sleep later at night so if someone's having um if they're working odd hours, if they're working night shifts, for example, their melatonin levels can sometimes be disrupted, and that's why people can have difficulties, difficulty to fall asleep. Um, caffeine also can suppress melatonin um, for up to 10 hours in some people. Some people are very sensitive, other people aren't. So um, this can lead to insomnia in a few individuals. So lastly, as I spoke a little bit about earlier, having grass-fed meats as opposed to grain feds as this is a better balance of the arachidonic acid to EPA ratio so having the organic grain fed um, the organic grass fed sorry um, is much better although it's quite expensive if someone is going to be having a lot of meat they should either be balancing this out with high dose EPA or trying to have um, the grass fed so refined and processed foods this mustn't be forgotten as well as refined foods really do encourage insulin and cortisol production so this causes a lot of stress in the body increases inflammation and then this can as a knock-on effect have a lot of effects on um, sleep for example and also mood just general mood um, can be affected a lot with imbalanced blood sugar levels and also having an abnormal glucose metabolism um, can cause difficulty maintaining maintaining these levels for, for children for example with ADHD often have um, hyperactivity with difficulties metabolizing um, glucose and then next is processed foods often have lots of hidden vegetable oils so even healthy considered foods such as hummus even has a lot of vegetable oils and there's just so so many products that has it in and may have been heat processed in the manufacturing processes as well so I'd always recommend people to have saturated fats such as coconut oil and butter if they're cooking as these are a lot more heat stable than vegetable oils so the summary of the diet and supplement plan in terms of all different types of mood and mind related disorders ranging from depression um, to ADHD type symptoms dementia this is the summary so I would say to include oily fish in the diet at least one to two times a week and especially from smaller fish so really do consider the amounts of contaminants in fish so if someone's just having tuna they may be having quite levels of high levels of these toxins um, and if it's canned for example may not be getting high amounts of the EPA so really make sure that people are getting lots of the smaller fish um, these may be herring mackerel um, mackerel especially very very oily so really good fish to recommend um, and then having a high dose EPA supplement so as we know now that our diets are very high in omega-6 and it's really really hard to avoid these fats with farming techniques and hidden vegetables um, it's quite good to balance this out with an EPA supplement so you don't have to go in and say to people they have to completely cut out all these foods but to be able to balance this to be able to get a good ratio between the EPA and the arachidonic acid is very important and recommending product without DHA as well especially for reducing inflammation and for mood and mind health so so important to have high dose EPA so making sure that the dose is one gram so thousand milligrams of EPA so when looking at a supplement um, it's no good just seeing that it's a thousand milligrams of omega-3 you really need to know what type of fat is in there has it been concentrated or is it just a generic fish oil so one gram of EPA very important um, so grass-fed lean meats instead of grain-fed meats and um, having other protein rich foods as well as meat and fish so not seeds eggs cheese beans and lentils all of these help to produce neurotransmitters in the brain and will help to reduce any kind of mood and mind related disorders and then limiting intake of vegetables and refined processed foods this is very difficult to recommend to people because they do often don't know what vegetables they're actually consuming and um, if they're having lots of processed foods but if people are cooking fresh then that is the best way really to be able to control how many vegetable oils you're consuming and lastly coconut oil or butter for cooking so heat stable oils very very important um, to have rather than having damaged 
vegetable oils. And that is everything. So um, if you have any questions at all, then feel free to write them in the little chat box in the corner. And otherwise, you can email me directly. So I'm happy to take any emails if you've got any more questions um, or if you want me to send you any information. Happy to do that. So please do email me. Someone's typing something. The slides of the presentation. Yes, of course, I will send those. Just waiting for a few more um, questions to come through. Copies of the slides, yep, sure. What about avocado oil for cooking? Um, avocado oil is very high in monounsaturated fats, so it's fairly heat stable, um, not as heat stable as coconut oil. But as long as you're not heating it to a very, very high temperature, so if it's not spitting, um, then that's fine. We'll say with, um, with olive oil as well, mostly monounsaturated fats, so fairly heat stable, um, depending on what temperatures you're cooking. Um, does the question, does Vajipa, oh, the questions are disappearing because you're writing so many. Does Vajipa contain any omega-6 at all? There's a very, very small amount of GLA omega-6 in the Vajipa. Um, 18 milligrams it is. Next question, what about taking high doses of evening primrose oil alongside the EPA? Evening primrose oil at 3 grams per day recommended for certain inflammatory conditions. I would only recommend having high doses of evening primrose oil if you're having a lot of EPA. Um, if someone already has a lot of inflammation in their body, you don't want to be putting too much omega-6 in just because it might be going to that inflammatory pathway um, converting to arachidonic acid. If someone's been having evening primrose oil for a long time and then they're suddenly having EPA added, um, this... Oh, <laughs> questions are coming. So I was saying, um, in terms of evening primrose oil, it's, it's just about the ratio between the two, really. You could have a very, very high dose of EPA, but I wouldn't recommend... Um, too much evening primrose oil if someone has a lot of inflammation in the body. The best thing to do would be to, to do a blood test, really, to find out. Can, can H2 receptor blockers such as Pectic, AC, and Tantac inhibit EPA absorption? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that one, Tom. Um, I'm not completely sure. And yep, to Daryl, of course, yes, I'll send you the slides. Um, so someone's asked, could you explain what Echium seed oil is exactly? Um, so Echium seeds are just like any other seeds. It's grown on a very big, tall, beautiful purple plant um, in the Canary Islands and in the UK and Ireland as well now. Um, so it's just a normal seed that's grown and the oil from it is particularly high in steroidic acid, so that's the omega-3 fat. So not many people have heard of it, but it's very, very useful for vegetarians to have the high level of steroidic acid. Anchovies in vinegar, does that affect EPA? Um, I don't think that vinegar would affect the EPA levels. Um, I can double check on that one, but I've, I don't think it would affect. A few more questions coming through. Um, for children with ADHD, so the question is, what digenous product would you recommend for children with ADHD apart from NeuroBalance? Um, I would recommend the Vegepa product. So we have um, Vegepa, we also have Vegepa chewables if um, a child is very young and they prefer having a chewable capsule. Um, but Vegepa, a very it's a very good dose and there'll be lots of studies with that particular product as well um, for children with ADHD. So Neurobalance and Vajipa, brilliant for children with ADHD. Uh, 
Um, Claire said, I mean for an intake of EPA. What do you mean by that? What enhances absorption of EPA? Um, in terms of enhancing absorption, the best thing is to eat, um, have the supplement with a meal. So if you're eating a meal that contains fat, that's going to enhance the absorption of the EPA. Um, so that's the most important thing, really, to have some form of fat with your meal. And then much more will be absorbed. Okay, Claire, I've explained it. Okay, good. So is that it? Has everybody asked all the questions? And if that's it, then you can always um, email me direct if you have any more. Uh, another question, how much chia seeds do you recommend? Um, in terms of having the oil or the actual seeds, you would have to have quite a huge amount of chia seeds to get the right amount of fats in. And they are similar fats to linseeds as well, so the alpha linolenic acid. So you would need quite high doses if you're trying to get an anti-inflammatory effect or an effect for, for mood health. Very, very high levels. So very similar to linseeds, only about 5 to 8% is converted down to the anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. Just a few more questions coming through. Um, so what age can children take the neurobalance supplements from? Um, a very young age, um, I think it's three, I'm just going to double check. Um, if they can swallow capsules, but it's designed for children, so a very young age. I can email you the exact age, Lexi. So I think that's it. I think I had lots of nice, interesting questions. So thanks for that. Um, and again, as I said, please do email if you need any information at all. If anyone wants the slides, um, for people that have asked, I'll send them to you. And if you need any more studies or information on the products, um, please do email me. My email is kylaw.igenus.com on the screen. Yep, Siobhan, I'll send the slides to you too. And Tina, yes, questions. Yeah, I can send them to everyone. So I'll find out those few things that were asked that I wasn't too sure about, um, and then I can email email you too. Great. Well, I'm sure I'll be in touch with a lot of you very soon. And thank you all for listening. And yes, this will be on YouTube as well. So if you even fancy listening to it again to, to recap, then you can. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you all tonight, and thank you for listening.